New pressure for change in the Kansas City Police Department and a recall effort to remove the mayor, plus Washington cutting a big check to extend the streetcar line. But is it enough to start laying down the track? The park board finds a new street to honor Dr. King, but where and why? And it's back to campus, classrooms, and crowds? The lessons from our Metro's biggest reopening experiment. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlee Scorley, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. People ask me, what are we going to talk about on this week's show? I say it's quicker to tell you what we're not going to talk about. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. So much is happening. It's hard to keep track. Trying to make sense of it all for us this week is KCUR's City Hall reporter Lisa Rodriguez, the managing editor of the Call newspaper Eric Wesson, from the pages of your Kansas City star Dave Helling, and Mr. Up to Date on KCUR FM, Steve Kraske. <laughs> These are the scenes capturing national attention this week after another shooting of a black man by a white police officer. This is Wisconsin. And the response is still being felt as one major sports team after another is now refusing to play in order to call attention to what they say is racial injustice at the hands of police. Here at home, Mayor Quinton Lucas demanding change and calling for a new series of measures to hold Kansas City police accountable. The move comes after the Jackson County prosecutor files felony assault charges against a Kansas City police sergeant. Matthew Neal is accused of planting his knee on the neck of a 15-year-old boy and forcing his head into the pavement. The victim can be heard saying, I can't breathe. Those, I realize, um, are now pretty infamous words. What's even more remarkable is that this incident happened back in November. Why is it now then making the headlines, uh, Lisa, nine months later? Well, Jackson County Prosecutor Jean Peters Baker says she was only made aware of this incident by, by the 15-year-old's attorney this spring, which speaks to the challenge that she's had in going after these cases, that she's not being notified by the police department. She's coming up against hurdles when she's requesting information. And so because of things like that, it takes something like nine months for something like this to come to light. Allegedly, then, you have a white police officer having his knee in the neck of a 15-year-old boy saying he can't breathe. Why is it, Eric Wesson, that we didn't see Sporting Kansas City saying this week we're not going to play a game, the Kansas City Royals saying they're not going to play a game, yet in Wisconsin, a person is shot by police and it's really wreaked havoc and is sort of cancelling seasons in major sports? Well, uh, the incident in, in Wisconsin started with the Milwaukee Bucks who play there. Uh, so that was probably one of the things, and it made national headlines. This incident didn't make local headlines until recently when she filed the charges. Is, is the I difference, though, that because there was no video in this case? There pro that probably was the difference. Uh, and the amount of time that it took before it became public. In Wisconsin, it was public almost immediately. Here in uh, Kansas City, it took nine months before we finally found out that the incident even happened. So the mayor is now proposing new changes uh, to hold the police accountable, Dave Helling, everything from requiring officers to intervene if they witness excessive force. The other would create an independent office of community complaints. I thought those changes had already taken place. Well, the police department and the police board will tell you that some of the things the mayor wants to do are already part of policy. Uh, one of the things that he's proposed, Mayor Lucas has proposed, is a duty to intervene, which is one of the big questions in the Matt Neal case, because there were at least a dozen officers on the scene that night. Why didn't any of them intervene to stop this alleged beating? That remains an open question, and I think the mayor wants to make sure that the policy of the, uh, the board makes that explicit. You know, Nick, what strikes me as amazing about this moment is that 
uh, just what you talked about. Why isn't this story getting more attention? Why isn't uh, the, why aren't the actions of the police department getting more attention right now? The Star's editorial board is taking them on. Lots of people in town are upset. It seems to me that maybe the only thing saving the chief and saving the department from really harsh condemnation right now might be COVID-19 because the community is so distracted right now with other things going on. I think in any other moment uh, of time that the police department and its actions in this case would be front and center on, uh, on everyone's mind. So what is this doing then, Eric Wesson, to the police chief's standing? Is it renewing calls, expanding calls for his resignation? I think that it's expanding the calls and, and giving people more evidence to say that. But I think what's protect and, and Stephen mentioned the COVID, protecting the chief. I think what's protecting the chief is the board of police commissioners. I believe that they were told, and I can't reveal sources, they were told by the chief to, to not process the complaint. So I think the chief has a lot of things going on, and I think he really, really needs to be replaced. We need to have a okay. serious conversation about you, that. You say he's being protected by the police board, but uh, Lisa, isn't he also still got the support of Mayor Quinton Lucas? He does. I mean, we, we've seen Mayor Quinton Lucas propose these reforms, but we have yet to hear him outright condemn the chief for any of these actions. And then even in the last few weeks, we saw the mayor put on pause this, this move, this election uh, referendum on local control. And so we're still operating under this same system whereby the police is governed by a board of commissioners that is not accountable to, to the mayor, to the city council, and to the residents of Kansas City. Now, there's also, by the way, an effort to recall Mayor Lucas. Uh, you might have seen the signature gatherers around town. Who's behind that effort, Dave Helling, and how much chance of success does that have? Well, uh, there's a saying in Kansas City politics, uh, Nick, that if you're the mayor and someone isn't seeking to recall you, you're not doing it right. I mean, every every mayor is subject to this, and it's very difficult uh, for this uh, committee of petitioners to go forward. I do want to back up just a little bit and talk about the police board in this respect. The, the uh, Urban League, Gwen Grant, and uh, SCLC, other groups, released an open letter today as we tape this to Mayor Lucas calling on the mayor to ask for the chief's resignation in the next meeting of the board of police commissioners and to in fact move to remove him and to see where the votes are. Lisa. I think the, the back on the recall effort, I think that is driven less by the mayor's stance on police issues and, and more by groups of people who just vehemently oppose his actions on the coronavirus. This is the, the issue of masks has become just a, a, this flashpoint that has really impassioned people. And those are the, the policies that they are objecting to. I spoke to the mayor about it last week. He says he's not worried in the slightest. And if a referendum were to happen, it would be on his actions during this pandemic. And he feels that easy, he would have overwhelming support. Steve. You know, there are more than 10,000 signatures already on a petition. You can get thousands of signatures on any petition. I think Lisa's exactly right. I don't think the mayor has anything to worry about. That said, voters might have a, get a say in this going forward. I just want to point out briefly, Nick, that the group that started the recall Quentin Lucas Facebook page, that happened the same night that the mayor extended the mask mandate. The group says there's no connection, but you can't help but wonder. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is back in the headlines in Kansas City this week as the Parks Board considers a new proposal to rename a street after the civil rights leader. What have they proposed, Eric? Swell Parkway, an uh, intersection, uh, a Volcker intersection, Blue Parkway, 50 Highway. Can we just do something to get this over with so that we can move on? Most young people don't know who Martin Luther King is until it's his holiday weekend or during Black History Month. So I just want us to do something so we can move on. Let's move on so we can fry, fry some bigger fish. OK, the Parks Board, Lisa, says they're going to hold two public hearings. Is it something the Parks Board can now just say we are going to rename those streets, uh, those intersections after Dr. Martin Luther King, or does it have to go to the ballot box for voters to approve? 
It, it doesn't have to go to the ballot box. The Parks Board um, can make these recommendations even when even when Paseo was renamed. That happened through City Council action. It only came to a public vote um, when when citizens you know gathered enough signatures to, to push it there. So I think this can happen. I don't expect it to come to a public vote. I think like Eric, people are ready to just see this happen in Kansas City. Steve. I agree with that. I think it'll be interesting to see how the park board reacts to the black ministers, Nick. This is the same group, of course, that pushed the name change for the Paseo so hard and saw that effort sort of backlash uh, right against them. That took a little chunk of the political cloud out of the backsides of the ministers. We'll see how, how they fare this time. Uh, Dave, one of the things about uh, naming something after Dr. King, there was an effort to say, let's have something that goes from the black community and bridges into the white community. The streets we're talking about there that would be renamed go from Volca to Blue Parkway, um, Parkway. Would, all, would all be on the east side. Right, although the Paseo was on the east side as well. I, I, you know, uh, it, Nick, it would be easy to pick apart any street renaming in Kansas City and find problems with it. But I do think this is a pretty interesting and important compromise, and it's helped by the fact that there aren't a lot of residences along these stretches of road. There are some, but not a lot. That's helpful because you don't have a lot of people in houses who are concerned about you know, changing their addresses or, you know, deeds or that type of thing. And so there may be less citizen opposition, and yet it still brings some visible presence to the east side. I think it will go forward. Two years after voters approved expanding the streetcar line from Union Station down to the plaza and UMKC, is the project finally now happening? Kansas City streetcar leaders say yes after the federal government cuts a long-awaited check for $50 million for the project. There were lots of jubilant news releases and social media posts, but does this really mean that crews can start tearing up Main Street and laying down the tracks, Lisa? It, I mean, it, it does. It means that utility work can start. They can start moving sewer lines, re, um, repositioning things, reconfiguring the water lines. However, there is still an ask for more federal money. They're still expecting at least some to the, you know, the tune of $120 million in federal funding to make it happen. And we won't see tracks or overhead wires or anything there until at least 2022. So we may start seeing activity along Main Street, but it's not a streetcar yet. But I did see, you know, when this project first started, Steve, it was going to be a $350 million project. So that's right. $50 million from the federal government. Where's all the other money come from? Well, uh, residents, Nick, and businesses along the route, there's this uh, mechanism in Kansas City called the Transportation Development uh, District that voters approved. It's a one cent sales tax within that district. That'll come up with a lot of this money. Let's not uh, sell short what a significant moment this is for the streetcar system and more largely for Kansas City. Uh, this is going to transform how the city uses mass transit. We have a circulator system right now. This is going to take it out to UMKC, take it out to the plaza. It's a big development, and it's an exciting day. Dave, there was fewer people currently are riding transit. The streetcar ridership is way down, and so are city coffers. There is furloughs. There are, we've been told there will be fewer staff members involved in maintenance. Does this compromise efforts to expand this and have the workforce there to make this happen? No, in large part because of what just Steve just talked about. There is a dedicated funding stream for this locally. It doesn't really, it's not really subject uh, to the general fund or some concerns that might involve the general fund at City Hall. There may be some pressure to back away from this because of COVID and the impact it's had on mass transit uh, in the weeks and months and years ahead. But uh, for those who have been planning for this extension of the streetcar, it's a pretty big moment. Uh, and suggests that this project is going to go forward at some uh, distance in the future. Now, the original plan was that this we would be riding this on, in 2025. Is that still the plan, Eric Wesson? Hopefully it is. I don't know if they're going to make it with the COVID, uh, but that was the original plan. And I think they'll, they'll come close. If it doesn't happen in 2025, probably 2026 or 2027. 
we should be riding a streetcar through that area. It was the first week of class for most of our area universities. UMKC, KU, Mizzou, and K-State all began in-person instruction this week, though many students are now finding that after moving into their dorms, all of their classes have shifted online. How long, though, can they stay open? At KU, at least 10 frat houses are now in quarantine. Is that prompting administrators to say, let's shut this thing down, Steve? Well, I think it is, Nick. I think this is an ongoing conversation that every university, not only in our neck of the woods, is having, but more broadly across the country. You know, the whole thing really blew up at KU. The student newspaper there, the Daily Kansan, called out the administration for having any in-person classes and said that the administration had lied to the student body about this whole situation. A lot of tension over there, a lot of bad feelings. And I think you're going to see some of that replicated in lo at lots of other universities this fall. More than 150 cases were reported of COVID-19 on the first day of class at MU, Dave Helling. More than 200 reported at KU. What would it take for our universities to halt in-person instruction? Is it 500 cases? Is it a death? Uh, well, a death would be an enormous uh, development, uh, Nick, and, and uh, my guess is it would cause uh, the immediate shutdown of any university where someone dies from COVID. But these illnesses are a great concern now. Where the threshold is, who knows? 250, 300, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure the colleges and universities uh, know the answer, but what we do know is that this is an epidemic. This is a transferable, transmittable disease and so if the kids in the frat house have it, other kids who don't live in the frat house are going to get it. That's very clear. My guess is what you're going to see is a lot of stopping and starting, quarantines, two weeks off, early dismissal, some effort by all colleges and universities to deal with it on the fly. There doesn't seem to be an overarching strategy to keep these schools operating as they used to operate. And Steve, you actually have another hat, of course, because you are a journalism professor at UMKC. Did you do in-person classes this week? Well, I just want to welcome you. If you ever want to come take my class, Nick, you'd be welcome to, to step inside. No, I'm teaching strictly online. And like so many professors here, Nick, it's not my preferred choice. I really like interacting with students in the classroom. But given my age and given the, what Dave just said about how transferable this thing is, I didn't feel I had any choice. And the administration here gave me that choice. So it was a good thing. Can what I just say quickly, Nick, that if you take Kraski's course, he's an easy A. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no. Yes, Eric. <laughs> so try you know, me. Students that are doing it online, do they have to pay some of their tuition? Does the university give them some of their tuition money back? That's a well, legitimate argument. Well, it's a legitimate argument, but so far the answer is no, Eric. And I can tell you that the expense of putting on an online class isn't that much different than doing it in person. I think that's what the administration is toggling with. And some students point out what, what, what you point to here and have some concerns about it. But, you know, the expenses of running this place go on in person or not. What about in our area schools? Well, most of our area school districts have decided to delay the start of school and to push back in-person learning indefinitely. It was back to school in independence, not virtually. They were sitting in actual chairs in real physical classrooms. It seems to be happening without incident. Was there any problems, Lisa? Not, not that we've heard about yet. And, and the independent school district has, has based their decision to, to open in person um, based on the fact that they didn't have any outbreaks during their summer school session. They say that they're keeping their class sizes small, taking all these precautions. But again, we're just in that first week of school right now. And I think it's too early to tell if, if this is truly the best plan to reopen. But we have a lot of school districts reversing course this week, uh, Dave Helling. I see in Lee Summit, some students will be coming back to class in DeSoto, some students coming back to class in person, and in Blue Valley also, some students will be coming back to class, at least part-time uh, in person. Is that saying that they think that health officials have been overly cautious? Well, I think that there has been some pushback against the so-called gating criteria uh, being used by uh, the county and by school districts, Nick. But we should make absolutely no mistake. The Kansas City region remains a hot spot for COVID-19. Cases are still troublingly high. And schools, colleges, K through 12, they're all going to have to deal uh, with that. In fact, I'm told the hospitals in the region are having a meeting within the next couple of weeks to talk about the spread in our area 
and ways to mitigate it because it is still a problem in the healthcare community, still a problem for the business community. It has not gone away. I'm interested to see will there be an uptick even greater after the Labor Day weekend when everybody's out having barbecues and having events that they're going to where people aren't wearing masks, there's no social distancing. Will there be an upswing in reported cases? And will there be an uptick uh, from people in our area going to sports games for the first time since the pandemic began. Sporting Kansas City invited fans back to Children's Mercy Park this week. Around 2,500 fans were allowed in to see the team take on Houston. Some eyebrows were raised about the wisdom of holding a game with even a reduced number of fans. The stadium, after all, is in the metro area county that has been hardest hit by COVID-19. So why did health officials in Wyandotte County sign off on it then, Steve? Well, I think there's some sense that they uh, they did, but you know whether the, the the sporting is going along with exactly what they said is a different matter. The club is uh, allowing 14 percent of the stadium's capacity to be used here, so we're talking about a very very small number. I think that's what health officials signed off on, but they are very much in danger here. The, the health officials are Nick of being seen as wanting to have it both ways. And this, of course, is a fraction of the number of people who will be going to Arrowhead Stadium soon, Eric Wesson, to see the Chiefs play, where you can have you know up to 20,000 fans in the in the stadium. It's about money. What's the bottom line? Let's make as much money as we can. Uh, public safety, it seems like it's on the back burner. Just quickly, these decisions by the sports franchises make things very difficult for community leaders, like Quentin Lucas, for example, who faces recall because of his mask orders. And businesses are rightly asking, why can you have fans at a Chiefs game? Or exactly. why can you accept fans at a sporting KC game when I have to limit my restaurant or keep my doors closed or require masks? It's a very difficult balancing act, and we have not a achieved a good balance yet. I, talking about balance, I mentioned the Democratic National Convention last week. This week, it was the Republican National Convention getting underway, and there were plenty of primetime speaking slots for a number of Kansas and Missouri names, including the man some people begged to run in this year's Kansas Senate race. Welcome to the 2020 Republican National Convention. Tonight, celebrating America as the land of promise. Hi, I'm Mike Pompeo. I'm speaking to you from beautiful Jerusalem. Good evening, America. We are Mark and Patty McCloskey. We're speaking to you tonight from St. Louis, Missouri, where just weeks ago you may have seen us defending our home as a mob of protesters descended on our neighborhood. What you saw happen to us could just as easily happen to any of you who are watching from quiet neighborhoods. Also speaking was Ann Dorn, the widow of a retired Missouri police officer, was shot and killed by looters amid a night of unrest in St. Louis following the George Floyd protests. There were tons of local candidates in other parts of the country featured, from house races in Maryland and Pennsylvania. So why not from here, Steve Kraske? Why wasn't there any room for an Amanda Adkins running against Sharice Davids or even a Roger Marshall now running for the Senate? Well, I was a little surprised, too, Nick. Uh, certainly, Roger Marshall's in a very uh, competitive race for the U.S. Senate in Kansas, and an appearance there might have helped. But not to overplay this too much, Nick, I mean, an appearance at this convention, not during prime time, isn't going to swing a race one way or the other. Were there any lessons for us here, though, in Kansas and Missouri as a result of the Republican National Convention this week, Dave? Well, I think you just featured or talked about the McCloskey's appearance and how they defended their home with a gun against a Black Lives Matter uh, protest. Uh, Nick, uh, this week, a 17-year-old allegedly went to Kenosha, Wisconsin, and shot two people dead uh, in a protest related to a police incident in that community. I think at, over time, the things that the McCloskey's talked about will be seen as not helpful at all. When you put a program like this together every week, you can't get to every major story making the headlines. What was the big story we missed? Laying to rest a mayor funeral services this week for Mike Copeland, who led Olathe for the past 19 years. He died unexpectedly at the age of 58. It was the horrifying story that rocked our city 20 years ago. A 10-year-old abducted in plain sight while rollerblading outside her home in KCK. Now justice for Pamela Butler, the man responsible executed this week at a federal prison in Indiana. He's on the ballot in a growing number of states, but he won't get a chance to vote for him here. Rapper turned presidential candidate Kanye West denied a place on the Kansas and Missouri ballots. Was it just a joke? What? Let me get my mask on. Okay, hold on. Yeah. 
An MU professor relieved of teaching duties after quipping he needed to cover his face after finding out one of his students in an online class was from Wuhan, China. A local artist going viral for his politically inspired crop art in a field near Lawrence. No word yet on whether he plans to unveil crop circles of President Trump and Mike Pence. And remembering one of Kansas City's most famous sons this weekend would mark jazz legend Charlie Parker's 100th birthday. We have a new documentary about his life. See it Saturday at 7. Lisa, did you pick one of those stories or something completely different? I, I went with something maybe a little less, less splashy but equally important uh, is that nursing homes all across Kansas are still struggling to be able to get rapid testing for COVID-19, which means that when, when an, uh, an employee has symptoms, they've got to stay home for days, meaning other workers have to work longer hours, putting at risk not only the people who are working at nursing homes, but also you know our, our elderly uh, family members who are there. And the fact that this long into a pandemic, we still haven't figured out testing is, is astonishing. Dave. Missouri Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft to talk to voters this week and said incredibly that if it were up to him, no one would vote by mail or words to that effect. That's an amazing thing for the top elections officer in Missouri to, stay, uh, to say. The debate, Nick, over voting by mail and absentee in Missouri will really accelerate between now and November 3rd. Eric. You mean I'm not going to get to vote for Kanye West? I got to write his name in? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think one of the things that we missed this week was this week, over the next week, they're going to start doing the murals in the street for Black Lives Matter. There are a couple of business owners that have called the newspaper and said that they really don't want it in front of their business. And is there going to be a community hearing so that people can determine where to put these signs? So I think that's a very interesting topic. And Steve. I think the 100th anniversary of Charlie Parker's birth, Nick, he was a musical pioneer right here from our neck of the woods. It's a very big deal. He changed music. His legacy is being celebrated all across the globe this week. And I know you were a huge jazz fan, so that makes I sense am. coming from you. Yeah. And he was born in Kansas City, Kansas, before moving over to the state line into the Westport area and then attending right. uh, Lincoln High School. And on that, we will say our week has been reviewed. Lisa Rodriguez from KCUR News, thank you for checking in with us, along with the calls. Eric Wesson, the stars Dave Helling, and keeping you up to date weekday mornings at 9 on KCUR FM, Steve Kraske. And I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at Kansas City PBS. Keep calm and carry on.